And so it is in the world of nature. The only weapons that animal has are raw instincts against a harsh, harsh land. I'm Paul Pinecone, and I'll see you again when nature calls. Hello there, nature nuts. Have you noticed how much great nature television there is these days? Ooh, it's a wonderful time to be alive. There are entire channels devoted to nature television, and I'm proud to be a part of that phenomenon. Now, of course, my personal goal is to inspire you to get out and see nature for yourself, but I understand there are days when you just feel like sitting back on the couch and watching the old tube. So today we're going to take a different slant. I'm going to present you with the Nature Nuts Guide to Watching Nature TV. <laughs> All right, okay, hold on. Here comes my favorite show. While I'm a nature nut, I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it. I'm just a simple case, open and shut. No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut. Today we'll go bird watching. Tomorrow we'll catch toads. The next day we'll take photographs of bugs along the road. I never get the feeling that I'm in a rut. That's why I'm a nature nut. Well, I'm a nature nut, I'm not afraid to admit. I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it. I'm just a simple case, open and shut. No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut. The splendor of the Canadian Rocky Mountains attracts millions of visitors each and every year. You know what they say? They say that television is nothing but a bunch of smoke and mirrors, as if that was a bad thing. Well, that's all true. But in some ways, there's no way around it. For example, did you know that this show, and probably most other nature shows, it's what we call a single camera shoot. There's only one camera. See? Look. There's the camera, there's Bruce the cameraman, and there's Bill the director in behind. And the rest of the crew, if you imagine a huge crew, you're wrong, because there it is. There's uh, Jeremy the sound man, and Chris, production assistant and co-writer. That's it, that's everybody, and that's pretty well all the equipment that we have as well. So, we go out on a nice day like this, this is a uh, Middle of the day, middle of February, by the way, and if you're watching it any other time, that's because the show is pre-taped. Some people actually think the show is live. Not true. We go out and we want to do something like, let's say we want to do a thing about bighorn sheep. Now I could look over this way and go, hey, up on the hillside, that's a bighorn sheep. When in reality, there are no bighorn sheep. In fact, there isn't even a hillside, it's just trees here. But the way we do it, is first of all, we go find the bighorn sheep. And we take a lot of tape of the bighorn sheep, and then I choose the best moments. Moments where the bighorn sheep paws the ground or something like that. Then we aim the camera at me, and maybe the place where the bighorn sheep was doesn't look like a very nice place for me, so we put me in some more scenic place, and I act surprised. Wow, I didn't notice that one. That's a really nice ram, and it looks like uh, a real moment that's happening spontaneously, whereas really it's just a, a matter of editing. But, like I say, there's really no way around it, and it's as close to reality as, uh, as we can muster with a single camera. So, nothing wrong with little smoke and mirrors. Nothing wrong at all. <coughs> Bighorn sheep can turn up just about anywhere in the mountains, making a casual sighting seem quite normal indeed. Now you've probably figured out that if you can use the magic of editing to make animals appear where in reality there are no animals, you might be able to cheat a bit with that. You could use shots from other times, other places, other sources, what we call stock footage. And uh, now for example, you could look over this snowy little ridge here, and there's a nice group of pronghorn. Yeah, it looks like they're probably enjoying uh, mid-fall temperatures. You can spot stock footage uh, because, well, you know, the lighting is often different, the season is different. 
Sometimes it's really tricky though. For example, if you look up in the sky here, there are monarch butterflies flying around. But against a blue sky, it's really hard to tell what temperature it is. Sometimes the fakery is uh, much easier to spot. For example, if we were to look into this greenery and see, there we go, a veiled chameleon lizard. Hmm, it's not gonna fool anybody. <laughs> now, I gotta tell you, I'm really proud of the fact that we don't use stock footage on this program, and then when we do, we always admit it. But, uh, boy, you could get away with almost anything. It's like, uh, oh, gee. Look at that, there's a western diamondback rattlesnake. Stock footage can change your entire view of the world, make you paranoid. I thought I was in the mountains. Suddenly there's waves lapping up on the shore right beside me. Urchins and rock crabs. Go figure. The chameleon in the last segment was actually a Jackson's and not a veiled, as if that really matters. You know, music is really important to nature shows as well. Depending on what kind of music you use, you can completely transform the feeling of a particular segment. Now on this show, all the music is done by Michael Becker. You've seen him on the show before. I won't disturb him, but there he is in his studio doing what he does best. Great. Howdy. I'm the guy that makes all the music for the nature nut. And I just got this tape, which uh, has what they call locked picture on it. So that's actually the footage that's going to go into the show. And those numbers going at the top is time code. And that's what I was hitting over there was certain posts in uh, the picture that I want the music to make an impact at those spots. The way I like to think of this is making music is sort of like making a sandwich, you know? Because what you're doing is you have to decide what kind you want and what are all the various ingredients and what's the main ingredient. So the main ingredient in this sandwich is the snake. And I think the snake wants to be kind of scary. Well, it's not all scary because there's John at the beginning of these shots. So I use a little, I use an accordion, which is, has become the typical statement for John. It's a light motif. I sampled the accordion. And so I thought, okay, well, we, we go with the accordion and then we make it scary. And then some of the other dressings, some of the other parts of the sandwich, if you like, are scary strings and there's a gong which hits when the snake comes into, sh into view. So let's see, let's see what we did. Well, it appears they didn't like that sandwich. <laughs> No, actually, it's, there are so many different ways to see these things that uh, sometimes it's uh, my version was uh, it's just not the version they were after. And uh, so I made this, one, this next one, I made not quite so scary. Now, you know, we also go to great lengths to make sure that there aren't uh, things like buildings in the shot, uh, power lines, roads, any sort of sign of civilization that makes it really clear that you're not always deep, deep, deep in the wilderness. Things that are just outside the boundaries of the picture on your television screen. See, hey, that's much better. Now I'm a woodsy guy out in the Canadian bush. And I'm about to tell you about the fish in the stream behind me, as if there's any fish in the stream behind me, but there's still a problem. The soundtrack is full of traffic noises. Traffic noises are terrible things for us. Plane noises are even worse. It doesn't matter how far out into the bush you get, there are still gonna be jets flying over just about anywhere on Earth. And as soon as a jet shows up, you have to quit working and wait till it goes away. Then, after the fact, you can put new sounds in to replace the original soundtrack. 
and hopefully you get those sounds right. Imagine what would happen if you put the wrong sounds instead of the right ones. Editors, they have immense power in any television production, but it's especially true in nature shows. I mean, let's think about the editing process for a moment. You start with raw footage, just a series of shots of, well, in this case, we're going to use the example of snakes of the northern Great Plains. So we've got a series of shots here that were taken on different dates in different places, two different rattlesnakes, two different bull snakes, and a hognose snake. And with that raw footage, the editor can then cut the footage together, so to speak, and you form a nice sequence with those images. Now, with these snake images, I think the, uh, you know, the honest thing to do would be just to tie them together, maybe do a little survey of these three species of snakes, talk about how the rattlesnake um, conducts its life, what its distinguishing features are, the rattle on the end of the tail, the broad triangular head, the heat sensing pits by the nose, and then compare that to the bull snake, a big beautiful snake that looks something like a rattlesnake, but it has no rattle on the end of the tail and quite a different look in its eye, not quite as broad a head. Um, and then the, the hognose snake, which uh, is a real good bluffer. It's a very angry, snappy little snake, but it's actually quite harmless. And uh, when you get close up, you can see that it has an upturned schnoot, which is very different from either of those two sorts of snakes. That would be how I would want that footage cut together. But if you wanted to, you could make a totally bogus story out of it. For example, you could, uh, well, you could start with the rattlesnake. The rattlesnake, who is always angry, so it's always rattling its rattle. And then it smells the bull snake on the prairie wind with its tongue and decides to go and kill the bull snake. And the bull snake senses that the rattlesnake is after it and gets nervous itself, and starts slithering away through the grasses. And the rattlesnake pursues it, and the bull snake eventually climbs a tree and escapes its full because after all rattlesnakes can't climb trees. Now that's total baloney but you know if you edit it together just right and people don't realize what's happening pretty easy to uh, pull the wool over the eyes as they say. <laughs> oh. Bull snakes do not eat rattlesnakes although king snakes sometimes do. Okay. Well, listen, today I got a little bit of a axe to grind with you. <laughs> it's a bone to pick, and I'll tell you what it's about. It's about these movies on TV. I don't know who makes them, but they're not studying enough. They're not spending enough time in places of high culture like museums. Because they're making dumb mistakes. And they really frosts my sphagnum when they do that. I'll tell you what's going on. Like, for example, you're watching the movie about tropical forests and places that, you know, not as if anybody would ever go there, but still, you got, you're listening away and there's a sound. Oh, it's so beautiful. It's a lewd. Can you believe that? Oh, boy. It reminds me of the other day I was watching this good movie, cowboy movie. I like those cowboy movies. Casper Humidine, my favorite cowboy. And he's going across the plains and he's tracking down Pecos Moose. Mean looking guy, never shaves. And he's riding a moose instead of a horse, which adds a certain peculiarity to the film. But then Casper Humidine runs out of water and he looks up and there the buzzards are circling. And you know what that means? Ha! That means you're about to get your gizzard picked. <laughs> but they're not buzzards. There's pelicans. Uh, pelican, how far down the trail is that gonna roll your barrel? Don't let them get away with that 
pelicans stuff. Does it just shows you're not educated? Saw peace, trouble, struggle, and quiet. All the usual things that might happen to people were here just the same. What a riot! Then Jillian left with a smile and a nod. She'd figured it out, don't you see? Life is no sitcom or drama or game, and nature is nature, not nature TV. Sitcom or drama or game, and nature is nature, not nature TV. Oh, a house sparrow. That doesn't do anything for my life list. Oh, that counts for my monthly list, though. That'll count for my winter monthly list. Apapani! That's a life bird! That's perfect! Give me something else. Oh, Nene! Nene, another great lifer! Is this you? A TV lister? You know, early in my television career, I spoke out. I was critical of listers, people who make lists of the birds they've seen in their life or out their back window or on Tuesdays, things like that. I even made a joke about how you could list things you see on TV and sure enough, I started getting mail from people thanking me for helping to build up their television life lists. It's a strange affliction and I must admit, I now feel fairly guilty for helping to perpetuate this misguided effort. Of course, I also get a kind of a laugh out of it. <laughs> oh yeah, that's nature. Now it's good to have expert biologists working on nature shows because that ensures the quality of the show and ensures that you're actually uh, learning something that's likely to be true. But I'll tell you, you know, a number of my friends and colleagues have had terrible experiences and uh, one of them's here today. Tell me, Professor, you've, uh, you've done this sort of work, vetting nature television shows? Oh, well, John, the first, uh, it's all started for me one day a couple of winters back, and a call came in to 
the institute and it was routed to me because it was a film producer working on a documentary having to do with mountain wildlife, which is of course my own personal academic specialty. Well, I talked to the fellow on the phone, he seemed like a real sincere guy, so I agreed to do it and frankly, John, I did it no charge. I feel as an academic with specialized knowledge, it's my duty to the community to help in the dissemination of accurate information. And, and what exactly happened at that point? Well, I took one look at that film, John, and I realized right then and there that a lot of the information was not just inaccurate but downright wrong i mean they were they were saying every species they put on the screen they said it was endangered whether it was or wasn't and i felt that was worth correcting so i took a fair amount of time on my own expense and wrote up a report outlining the items that i thought needed to be changed imagine my surprise john when i saw the same film with all the original mistakes intact and sure enough at the end there's my name in the credits along with the name of my institution I mean, that's that's a real shame that's really too bad that that happens far too often in my opinion frankly i think it's a sign that the world is just simply in a downward spiral i mean it's like the youth of today when I was a kid, we used to go to bed 7, 8 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Now they're up yeah. 10, 11. Some of them are wearing inadequate footwear in the middle of the winter. They're drinking yeah. too much soda footwear. pop. And, John, I don't think they're brushing their teeth as often uh, as they yeah, should yeah. either. And action. And so it is in the world of nature. The only weapons that animal has are raw instincts against a harsh, harsh land. Thank you for watching. I'm Paul Pinecone, and I'll see you again when nature calls. Okay, that is a cut. Thank you very much. Actually, I thought I popped a couple of peas. No, no, it was good. It oh, was really good. good. I'm glad you liked it. Yeah, it was perfect. Good, good. Um, set her up. Let's do her again, folks. Again? You said it was perfect. How can I do that better? Bigger. 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 Bigger is in Saskatchewan. Bigger is not in my contract. I'm calling my agent. I can't get any reception. Makeup, can we get some makeup on this guy? And my latte, double decaf, no fat. In my trailer, bring a friend. Excuse me. That's a wrap. Hey, is it just me? <laughs> See, in my opinion, nature shows should be hosted by nature people. It's not really fair to actors. I mean, after all, they train to be actors. They don't have to know anything about nature, and the same thing is true of television writers, television researchers, television directors, producers, editors, you name it. I think you need someone in there who is truly a nature nut of one sort or another, or it all starts turning out the same, all sort of mushy and sappy and overdramatic, with things like Paul Pinecone in it. Each episode of this show takes about two weeks to plan, three days to shoot, and two weeks to edit. <laughs> oh man, I haven't had this much fun for a long time. But we're running out of time. Brings us to the end of the Nature Nut Guide to Watching Nature Television, which I truly hope will enhance your own television viewing rather than detracting from it. I hope you don't get the impression that I'm criticizing anyone else's nature shows here. After all, my belief is that there's no better subject to put on the screen and share with the rest of the world. I should also, before we go, I should thank my good friend Ron Chamney who helped out with this show. He was a really good sport, played the part of both Paul Pinecone and uh, Jillian Fillet. So, anyway, until next time, I'm a nature nut. And I'm a pinecone. And we, we hope, hope you, you are, are too. <laughs> Paul Pinecone, you must have been watching too many reruns yeah, of my show. I like the wig. Yeah, the wig was nice. time each and every week uncensored and uncut no doubt about it i'm a nature nut <laughs>